Today's class, we're going to be looking at applications. Where is it that we can use sine and cosine graphs to model real life situations? And some of the questions, like example one here, this is the easiest type of question because in the question, they give you the equation. The depth of water is given by the equation d of t equals negative 4.5 cos 0.16 pi t plus 13.7. And we are going to sketch this graph. So looking at the equation and thinking about dab C, what's our D value? Thirteen point seven. So on your y-axis, we're going to put 13.7 somewhere. As soon as we do that, we create a scale on our y-axis. So now our amplitude is 4.5. So we need to go up 4.5 and down 4.5 from our sinusoidal axis. So that will put us up to 18.2 and down to 9.2. So then where I put my 13.7, I kind of estimated what should 4.5 be like. It's kind of like a third of 13.7. So that's where I kind of got a basic scale correct for where I would put those values. Our B value is 0 0.16 pi. How would you find your period? This is not mental math. Well, how you find it is, describing it is, but then actually calculating it, right? Our period is 2 pi divided by our B value. So we're going to have to go to our calculator and figure that out. Twelve point five. Yeah. And we take our period and divide it into four equal sections. So half of 12.5 is 6.25. Half of that would be 3.125 and then 9.375. <coughs> the next part is drawing it temporarily before the shift. But if you look in the question, can you see that there's no shift whatsoever? And so when we go to draw it, it's going to be the final graph. Where does a cosine graph start? At a maximum, but this cosine graph is a negative cosine graph. So it's going to start at the minimum, then center line, then maximum, then center line, then minimum. The next thing I want you to be to do is to type this equation into your graphing calculator. Because for part B, part B is asking <coughs> a big ship needs at least 14.5 meters of water to dock safely. How many hours per cycle can the bulk carrier dock safely? So if we look back at our graph, 14.5 is right there. Can you see that only from here to here, the green graph has a depth that's bigger than 14.5? So what we're going to do is this is an example of a question preparing for next year 
where if you got this question, the fastest way to solve it would be to use your graphing calculator. So we need to get good at using our graphing calculator. The first thing we have to do is type that equation into y equals, and then I need you to make your graph so it looks the exact same size as what I drew on the board. And we're going to look at how we do that. So we go to our calculator. First of all, our mode needs to be in radians if it's not. Go to y equals. And negative 4.5 cos 0 0.16. pi x plus 13.7. So if you have your equation in there, sometimes when you hit graph, as it is in my case, nothing shows up. Hmm. The reason nothing shows up is because the window I have that I'm looking at on my screen my graph might be below it, or it might be to the left, or above it, or to the right. I can't see it at all. So how do we use our window button right beside y equals to make it look exactly like we see here? Okay. So first of all, on my graph, my x values go up to 12.5. And I see a little bit to the left. So I might start at negative 5 and go up to 15. That will show me my x-axis. If I think about my y-axis, my y-axis maximum went up to 18.2. So I might go down to my y-min. I like to put a little bit of a negative value in there just so that I can see the axis and go up to 20. Other things you can do to have fun with this, this button right here. <coughs> That's your x scale. Right now, if I graph this, it'll make ticky marks, that's what I call them, whenever it goes over 1. If I wanted to match up perfectly with these ones, I can make my ticky marks 3.125. And then it will put exactly those four that are on there. For my y scale, there's nothing that really helps me get to those 13.7 and 9.2 and 18.2, but I can just maybe make it go up by fives. Now when I hit graph, my graph looks really similar to the one that we graphed. Now to find out when the depth of the water is 14.5, what you can do on your graphing calculator is you can draw a horizontal line in the second equation. What's the equation of a horizontal line? x equals or y equals? y equals, yes. OK, check your equation. If you're only getting in a horizontal line, one of two things could have happened with your equation. One, you're still in degrees. Or two, you forgot to put the x in. Was it the forgetting the x? So in y2, I'm going to type in 14.5. And that will draw the horizontal line across at 14.5. So I can then say from my calculator, I need to find these two points. If I go to my I'm going to just copy my screen into my smart board here, make it a little smaller. There it is. I need to find this point and this point and figure out exactly where they are. And if I can find out where they are, I'll be able to find out the time between them and figure out for how long this ship can be safely in the harbor. So your calculator has all these things nicely built into it, lots of calculations. Above the trace button 
is calculate. So if you push the second button and trace, there's a bunch of things that you can calculate. You can calculate x-intercepts. You can calculate <coughs> any value for x. But in this case, we're interested in number 5. Where do they intersect? So if you push enter on intersection, it'll automatically start on one curve. And it'll say, do you want this to be your first curve? I say yes, so push enter. Do you want this to be your second curve? I say yes, push enter. Do you want to guess? You can guess if you like, but you just have to push enter again. And then it finds your first value at 3.48. <coughs> so this one right here is at 3.48 hours. The second one, we go through the same process, okay? We go second, calculate, number five, intersection. And if I push enter three times right now, it'll find the same one again. Your calculator always finds the closest intersection point. <coughs> so in this case, I'm going to have to use my arrow keys until I get closer to the other one. Come on. Just get over that hill. I'm already closer to the other one. That would be far enough. Enter, enter, enter. And the next one's at 9.02. So if I go back to my calculator and I take 9.02, and minus 3.48. So I want you to think about how long it took you to graph your equation and to set up your window to graph your second equation and to find the intersection points. Okay? I want you to think about all that process. One of the things next year in grade 12 in the IB course, you want to be able to think of that and be able to do that all quickly. But how long in general will that take you? Maybe a minute, maybe a minute and a half. It's not a super long time. Okay? The next thing I'm going to show you, and I'm not going to get you to write it down is the algebra that you would need to do to figure this out. Okay? And when you get to university, you'll be expected to know how to solve the algebra. So first of all, you would set up your equation and you know the depth is supposed to be 14.5, so you can substitute that in the equation. Once I substitute 14.5 into the equation, can you see in this equation, the only thing you don't know is t? <coughs> and do we have algebra skills to solve for t? Yes. Do we know everything algebraically to solve for t in this situation? I'm going to say mostly yes. There might be one step in here that I'm going to introduce to you that's sort of like, oh, I might not have thought of that. But it's a little bit complicated. First of all, it's a cosine equation. How have you solved cosine equations in the past? If you wanted to solve for the angle, you would get cos <coughs> by itself. So in the same sense, I'm going to subtract 13.7 on both sides. Please don't write this down. There's not enough time. I'm going to go too fast and then divide by 4.5. Can you see that gets us cos by itself? And in this case, things are a little bit difficult because we've got a whole bunch of stuff inside of cos. In fact, if we think about it, we might say, this would be a lot easier. I know what to do if it was just cos theta equals this. Then I could do inverse of both sides, find my reference angle, cos is negative, and quadrants 2 and 3, use my reference angle to find the angle in quadrant 2, use my reference angle to find the angle in quadrant 3. In fact, 
the idea of solving a sine or cos or tan equation by getting a reference angle, using the cast rule, finding out which quadrants was on your take-home quiz, it's like one of the biggest concepts of grade 12 that you use the most. Just solving angles in general using sine, cos, and tan. So because it would be easier if this was just a theta, a strategy to use is to introduce a theta and say, let's make theta equal to the inside. So then my equation, instead of looking complicated, looks more straightforward. And if I have cos of theta equals this, well, I would go to my calculator, I'd do cos inverse, and I would find my reference angle. Remember when finding a reference angle that we're always doing the inverse of the positive ratio because a reference angle is an angle of a triangle. That triangle, it doesn't matter what quadrant it's in, when you're figuring out angles in a triangle, all the lengths are positive lengths. And so we get, in this case, our reference angle in radians to be 1.392. Now, of course, because cos is negative, cast rule says that it has to be in quadrant 2 or quadrant 3. In quadrant 2, you do pi minus your reference angle. In quadrant 3, you would do pi plus your reference angle. So we get two answers for theta. And once we've got both of our answers for theta, we think back and say, hey, wait a minute, what did I, what did I, what was theta? Theta was equal to 0 0.16 pi t. So I can take this and substitute it back in. Instead of theta equaling 1.7495, I can make the 0 0.16 pi t equal to 1.7495. So I substituted it to make it easier. That allowed me to solve it with something that I was familiar with. And then once I solved for theta, then I could substitute back. And now, what do I need to do? Divide both sides by 0.16 pi. And I get 3.48, which was our first angle answer. What about quadrant 3? Same thing. Get 9.02. And if we subtract them, we get 5.54 hours. Looking at all the algebra, I think that would take longer than your graphing calculator. And one of the things next year that you have to become really skilled in is deciding if I have a calculator for this question, is the, I might know how to do the algebra, but is there a calculator way that would be faster? Because you're not given extra time on that exam, and they give you like a two-hour exam that you have 90 minutes to do it in. So there will be some that you might just have to leave blank just by time restraints. But one of the things we start working on already is getting our mind thinking about if there are different strategies, which is the fastest one. And sometimes that doesn't mean, because sometimes I know in the past you might just be like, oh, I understand this strategy. I'm going to use it all the time because I get this one. I know there's other strategies, but I'm just going to focus on one. Unfortunately, in math, that's not always the best idea because some strategies are faster in one situation but slower in another situation. And another strategy is slow in one situation but faster in the other situation. So trying to learn them all is what's going to help you the most moving forward. Okay. Second question. This one's a little bit more difficult because you have information about what's happening but you're not given the equation. The information, however, will be enough for you to graph it. And then we learned yesterday that if we have a graph, we can sort of reverse dab C and get the equation for it. So here we have a Ferris wheel with a radius of 15 meters, rotates once every 20 seconds. Passengers start at the bottom, which is one meter above the ground.
So draw a picture of this. So I'm going to draw my Ferris wheel right here. Nice little chairs all the way around. So much fun. Oh, better connect it. So there we have our Ferris wheel. And right beside that Ferris wheel, I'm going to draw my y-axis and my x-axis. So I can transfer the information from that picture onto my graph. Okay, Like most Ferris wheels, you get on up at the bottom, at one meter above the ground. Makes sense. I would hate to see, it would be kind of scary if they had like, you had to climb up this ladder and then sort of jump down into the seat right at the top. Probably not too safe. So you get on at the bottom, which is a one meter. So here at one meter, we're getting started. Our next point, let's think about points here. Can you see this is getting on at one meter? This would be the maximum. What is the height of that maximum point? Thirty-one. How did you figure that out? Thirty-one's not in the question at all. Yeah, our radius is fifteen. So times our radius by two, we would get thirty-one. Does it make sense that right here in the center would be our center line? What is the equation of our center line? My scale is not very good here. It's going to be at y equals 16. Because our radius is 15, we can either go up 15 from 1 or down 15 from 31. So this point that at th is at the top is at 31. When will you be at the top? At what time? If you're at the bottom at 0 seconds, when are you going to be at the top? At 10 seconds. 10 seconds, you're right up here at the top. And what's going to happen in another 10 seconds? At 20 seconds. You're going to be de back down at the bottom. Can you see that if it rotates once in 20 seconds, that our period is going to be 20 seconds? So if our period is 20 seconds, when we normally graphed, what did we do to the x-axis with our period? Divide it into four equal sections. It's already divided in half. I'm just going to add 5 and 15 on here. And if we think about our graph, well, that's where it would be 5 seconds, you'd be right here. 15 seconds, you would be around and right there. And so we've drawn a picture of our Ferris wheel. We should get used to the habit of la labeling our graph even more properly. So along my y-axis, well, what did y-axis stand for? It stood for height, and we should add our units. Good thing this is in meters. Should have added kilometers in here. Can you imagine a 15-kilometer Ferris wheel radius? Wow. It goes around in 20 seconds. Wow. You can figure out how fast you would be going along the outside. And here, this is time. And add our units in seconds. So we've got our graph. Now we can find the equation and to get the equation, it's just the opposite of dab C. And the dab part is going to be the same 
no matter which equation you pick, sine or cosine. This one, it just says find its equation, so it didn't ask in sine or in cosine. Later on, they ask for one in sine and one in cosine. What we're going to do on this one is we're going to find a couple of different equations because there's more than one right answer. But can you see that your d value is always going to be 16? That's our center line. Our amplitude is distance from the middle to the maximum, 15. That's never going to change. Your period, right, we have a formula that says our period is 2 pi over our b value. Rearranging this formula says that our b value has to be 2 pi over our period. And so when I go to write my b value, I think, oh, I can see from my graph that my period is 20. So that means my b value is 2 pi over 20. And I personally really like to not simplify that fraction. Because if I leave it as 2 pi over 20, that is already in a form where I look at it, I can see the period is 20. No extra math has to be done. Because my period, right, my b value is 2 pi over my period. And if the 20 is on the bottom, then I can see my period right in the question. And I'm not going to write anything for the c value yet because that changes. The c value changes if you're thinking about a sine graph because the starting point for a sine graph is in the middle going up. Or if I'm thinking about a cosine graph, which is at a maximum. So when you go to write your equation, you can write your a value. You can choose sine or cos. We'll do sine first. You can write your b value. Leave space for your c value and write your d value. Now, if I choose a sine graph, and a sine graph starts in the middle going up, okay? I'm going to label that point in purple. Here's the middle going up. Where's that starting point? Shifted 5 to the right. How do I show a shift of 5 to the right in an equation? Minus 5. If I wanted to do my cos graph, my a value would stay the same. My b value stays the same. My d value stays the same. The dab part stays the same. But now I'm going to color code this in dark red. Where does a cos graph start? At a maximum. When does that maximum happen? If I've shifted. 10 to the right. How do I show a shift of 10 to the right? Minus 10. My favorite equation for this one, yes. Okay. So if we look at the graph, okay, a sine graph starts in the middle going up. Where does that happen? Can you see that that's at the purple point? Where does that purple point happen along my x-axis? 5 to the right. So in the dab C, if you were graphing this with dab C, what you would have is you would have a dotted graph looking like this to begin with. And then you would take each of those points and shift them 5 to the right. And where does the sine graph normally start? In the middle. So it would be at 0, and now it's been shifted 5 to the right. Does that make sense? For the red one, it's been shifted 10 to the right. My favorite <laughs> equation for this one would be a negative cosine graph. So my amplitude is still 15. My period is still 
2 pi over, or my b value is still 2 pi over 20. My center line is still at 16. Where does a negative cosine graph start? At a minimum. Okay? I can do this one in fluorescent yellow because it won't matter if you can't read it. What kind of shift has happened? Nothing. So if you can't see that, ignore it. It's actually better on the screen. On my computer screen, it's like hardly see yellow. Should we do that? A day of notes all in fluorescent yellow? Yes, yes to see how well your eyes adjust. <laughs> And finally, if you wanted to, you could also make a negative sign graph. You no, know, you probably wouldn't want to, but you could. We'll choose orange. Where does a negative sign graph start? In the middle going down. How much of a shift is that one? 15 to the right. So I would go. Minus 15. Okay? Are those the only four answers? No, because your graph goes on forever. You could have chosen for your sine graph, right? It's in the middle going up there. Can you see it's going to be in the middle going up again at 25? And then again at 45? And then again at. And so if you wanted to really, you know, if you're frustrated with how much math you have to do, then you could work extra hard on a test and say, I'm going to shift it 200,000, 2,005 to the right. Well, I might deduct marks because I have to work so hard to correct it. I'm just kidding. <laughs> if it's right, it's right. But <laughs> it, <laughs> no. And in fact, I would probably tell you, you know, that's clever, but it did take you more time, and so it wasn't the fastest way to do it. If I give, if, yeah, well, I have, to, I have to think of my own sanity. If I offered five bonus marks, <laughs> if you give a crazy shift, I think it you would, well, I know, but I think how many of you would do it? Almost all of you would do it. And then I'd have to mark 24 different answers because all 24 of you decided to do something crazy. Is it, is it's not, yeah, that's right. If you make the mistake, if you're off, right? So again, I want you to type, choose one of these equations, and type it into your calculator. <coughs> you can clear out the one you had before. And then set your window up so it matches the window that we have. So in part B, once you've got that in, and we've got a graph here, first of all, it says estimate the height at, after 22 seconds. So if we were estimating this using our graph, the graph that we drew, I could add 22 seconds right here. I could go up to my graph, and I could say, according to my graph, I think it is about 5 meters. You have, your window is way too far to the right. Or, you type, it looks cool though. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so, 
my estimate from my graph where I know my scale isn't the best, but I'm estimating at 5 meters. How do we use our graphing calculator to find that answer? We can go second, calculate, and we want to find a value, number one, when x is 22, push enter, it finds it, it was 3.86. So that is more accurate than us just guessing. And the next one, estimate what time you will be 20 meters above the ground. So if I look on here, 20 meters, there's a place where you're 20 meters above the ground, there's a place where you're 20 meters above the ground. How can we use our <coughs> graphing calculator to estimate this? So according to my graph, I might say 6 seconds and 14 seconds. So that's just, but if I want to find it exactly from my graphing calculator, I have to go to y equals, put 20 in, draw the line at 20, and then calculate where those intersect, number 5, enter, enter, enter. 14.1, I was really close. Fourteen point one seconds. How come I can find this one without my calculator now? How can I be so accurate and know that this one has to be at 5.9 <coughs> seconds without my calculator finding that intersection point. Okay, so the question is on the graph, because the graph is the hint, if I know this one's at 14.1, how do I know where this one is? I want a one word answer because of, and then you fill in the blank, what word am I looking for? Do you need, do you need a hint? Okay, starts with S, rhymes with Dimitri. Symmetry, good. <laughs> Yeah, the curve is symmetrical. And so because you've gone 4.1 to the right of 10, you're going to go 4.1 to the left of 10. Everything in a circle repeats itself, and there's a lot of symmetry involved. All right, our last example. Tides. Tides come in, tides come out. It's periodic in nature meaning that they can model what the tides are doing using a sine and cosine equation. Why is that important? Because they need to give schedules to boats coming in and boats coming out. And so we've got a very important application here that's, that's used in all places where tides are problematic. They need to figure that out. Okay? Most of us don't have to worry about it because we just go onto the app that some mathematician helped make that says when are the tides in and when are the tides out, and you get the information from there. Again, in this question, the equation isn't given, but there's enough information for us to draw the graph. We are told at 4.30 a.m., the maximum depth of 8, so I'm going to add 8 up here, Now, if I go to put values for time, so I'm going to put my depth in meters here, and I'm going to put my time 
down here. If we're going to put these values into our calculator later, later whoo, that's, then 430 I don't, is hard, going to be hard to put into our calculator. What could we put in instead of 430 to represent that time? 4.5. Is everybody okay with 4.5 because 30 minutes is half of an hour? And we have this point at 4.30, it's at 8. Six hours, 12 minutes later. Okay, so if this is four and a half hours, that looks like six hours and 12 minutes later. It's at a depth of 2. What time am I going to put under that ticky mark? Six hours and 12 minutes later is 10.42. Do I put 10.42? No, because it's more than half an hour. How do we change the 0 .42 to a decimal? It's 42 out of 60 minutes. So this will become 10.7. And this is all the information that we're given. We're given a maximum point, the next minimum point, and they tell us that it is periodic, meaning that it com completes this cycle over and over again. So my next question is, when is the next maximum going to be? What time is the next maximum going to be? in 6.2 more hours. So at 16.9, we'll go to a 24-hour clock. Why 6.2? Can you see that it is 6.2 in between there? So if it's periodic in nature, it'll take another 6.2 to get back to the top. We can divide this into four equal sections. Half of 6.2 is 3.1, so this will be at 7.6 and 13.8. Do you have enough information to find the center line? Center line is going to be right there in the middle. What's its equation? y equals 5. And so now we divide into four equal sections. You would know those ones would be on the center line. The center line is in the middle between 8 and 2. So one way you could do it is guess and check and say, well, 5 is 3 away from 8 and three away from two, so it has to be right in the middle. The other thing that we've called our center line is an average. How do you find an average? Let's say on uh, your favorite subject, English, you got 8% on your first test, and then you got 2% on your next test. What is your average in that class? How do you find out an average? You would add eight plus two, get 10, divide by two, you get five. Yeah. That will always find the middle as well. Okay, so now we've drawn our graph. The question is, do we have enough information to reverse dab C so we can get an equation in sine and cosine? Well, what's our d value? It's 5. What's our amplitude, the distance from the center line to the top? It's 3. How long does it take to do one full period? It's 12.4 hours. So what's our b value going to be? 2 pi over 12.4. I just doubled 6.2.
because 6.2 was from the maximum to the minimum. That's not one full period. That's half of it. And so another 6.2 would get us back to the maximum. You could also take your maximum point at 16.9, subtract your maximum point at 4.5, and you would get 12.4 that way as well. That's the dab part. So now we can write out two equations right away with the same amplitude one in sine, one in cosine, the same B value. One for the sine, one for the cosine. Leave space for the C value and have the same D value at the end. Where does a sine graph start? In the middle going up. You could choose either to use this one or this one. The 13.8 is already labeled, so you could say 13.8 to the right. If I went back 3.1, I would get to 1.4, so you could have went minus 1.4 as well. Where does a cosine graph start? At a maximum. Well, we know that our maximum is 4.5 to the right. Part B says estimate the depth. Estimate the depth at 130. So if we were just estimating 130, on this graph would be where? Thirteen point five. So maybe I would make my estimate to be fourteen point five meters. If I wanted to find it exactly, I would have to type the equation into my calculator and get the value from the graph. Yes. Four equal sections. Yeah. And the 13.8 actually helped us because that was in the middle going up. And we needed to divide into four, four equal sections to find out that the distance between the first and the section and the start was 3.1, half of 6.2. Yes, Terry. What's, how's the? That's a good question. Did I write 14.5 or did I write 4.5? Okay. Yeah, I meant 4.5. Thank you. I meant 4.5 and my brain added one more. There we go. Yeah, it's just an estimate. If you wanted to find it exactly, you would have to type it into your calculator. Thank you. 3.12. So my, est my graph is a little bit off. But now if a question says estimate in that sense, you can just look at your graph. And as long as you are like reasonable, they would give you the mark. So because 13.5 is before 13.8, you can't have anything above 5. That would be a bad estimate with respect to where things are. 13.5 is closer to 13.8, so chances are you're going to be somewhat closer to 5 than you are to 2, but reasonable. If you showed your work, like if you wanted to show your work by going up over here and then over to here, and then went, oh, this is 4.5. That would be a reasonable way to estimate it. Okay, what's wrong with my graph? I'm not sure that all of these distances are right. My scale was drawn not with a ruler, not with graph paper. So I could improve my estimates with a more accurate drawing. 
Have you guys seen the official IB graph paper?